We praise the Lord for how He has allowed us to join the 57th General Assembly of the Christian and Missionary Alliance Churches of the Philippines at Bacolod City. Let me bring your imagination to a reality that you and I are familiar about, something that I also experienced when my father died in 1995. He was shot on his face, two bullets landed on his face, four bullets landed on his body, and he was left dead on the spot right in front of the truck that they were using to buy some rubber materials in Goodyear, Kabasalan. When the incident took place, he was brought to a funeral home because he died on the spot, and then after a day, he was brought to our house. When he arrived there, we cannot believe about what happened. But as the funeral services went on night after night, the most common comment that I have heard from the people around me was, why him? He died at the age 43. And one of those individuals who commented the statement, why him, was my uncle, who happened to be a close friend of my dad, a brother of my mom. When my father was there lying inside a coffin, I heard from his mouth saying, why him, when in fact he is a noble man? Why him when in fact he is a close person to my heart, a person close to my heart? Why him when he's kind to others around him? I heard the same comment from our relatives asking, Why him God? There are other people there who are evil. There are other individuals who are more sinful than he is. Why him? Why him when his family is not yet ready for him to depart? Why him? I heard the same comment from the very mouth of my mother, saying, Why him, Lord, when my children are still small? Why him, Lord, when he is a good husband to me? And I found myself saying the same comment, the same statement, the same question before God. Why him, Lord, when he is a good father to me? I think this kind of query is asked by many individuals who go through sufferings in life and they think about their condition, they evaluate their situation, they could not make sense out of it, and they resolve to ask question to God, why him? Why my family? Why do you allow me to suffer this kind of condition? And this reality is not only experienced by Filipinos, but this is a matter that is asked by people all over the world when they go through sufferings. Why me? And the very general question is that, why does God allow suffering to be experienced even by righteous people. As I have told you before, becoming a Christian would not excuse us from sufferings, from painful experiences. Then we ask the question, why does God allow the thing to happen? Do you have an answer to the query? Well, I have an answer for all of us tonight, coming from the book of Job, chapter 1, verses 1 to 22. This time we will read the entire chapter. Job chapter 1, verses 1 to 22. I'll read from the Nasbi 1995 edition, and the word of the Lord says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him, his possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all men of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When the day of feasting had completed their cycle, Job would send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, Perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where do you come from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. The Lord said to Satan, 
Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. Now on the day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans attacked and took them. They also slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the ship and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another one, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid on the camels and took them and slew the servants and the ed- with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. May the good Lord bless the reading of his word. Again, the question that I have asked earlier, why do good people suffer evil on this planet? Job was a character in the Old Testament time. He was a person that was described in the earlier verses of the chapter as blameless, upright, God-fearing, and someone who runs away from evil. And I imagine those four statements about him, blameless, upright, God-fearing, and he runs away from evil, they are almost redundant. Why did I say that? Because they are closely similar to each other if you look at the meaning of those four descriptions about him. Blameless, upright, God-fearing, and he avoids and runs away from evil. Those statements are very closely related, if not the same with each other. Why did the author describe him that way? Because there is no other words that he thought of to describe the uprightness, the blamelessness of Job. Added to that, Job was described in the earlier verses, if you look at verses 2 and 3, as a person who was not only righteous and blameless in the sight of God, but he was described also as a wealthy man. It is clear there that his wealth was elaborated. He had thousands of sheep, thousands of camel, hundreds of donkeys, and hundreds of oxen, and many, many servants as described by the author. So it is clear to us that having all of these possessions, he can be categorized as a wealthy person in the East. Thus, Job is not only a righteous person, not only a blameless man, but a wealthy man. Thus, it gives us an idea that it is possible for a human being to remain godly and become wealthy. Okay? Because in our time today, we think that when a person is wealthy and he is working for a big company or a government office, many people would think, kasi mayaman. Many people would think if the person has a business and would say, maybe he's not remitting properly his taxes, that's why he's rich. Or maybe if we see someone, a kind of profession that he is, we would say, nangungurakot yan, kaya yan mayaman. It is possible for a human being to be wealthy and remain righteous before God. 
So let's not discard that possibility. Job was described as a righteous man, a blameless guy, and at the same time, a wealthy person. Added to that, he is a kind of guy who is concerned about his children. He is a kind of guy who was leading his children to God, to the righteousness, to the path of righteousness. Why did I say that? You look at verses 3, 4, and 5, you would see there that his children from time to time would have party, party in life. And every after the cycle of the feast, Job would make sure that there is a kind of ceremony that he would conduct so that his children, if they did something wrong in the eyes of God, then they will experience the forgiveness of God through the sacrifice and the offerings and the ritual that he would do. So he is a kind of guy who is not only a wealthy person, a person who is upright deep within his heart, but he is a guy who leads his family, particularly his children, into the right path. That's an ideal man of God, okay? This is a kind of person that you, could ab- you would be able to say if you look at him, sana all. Sana all ganon. Sana katulad ni Job lahat. Upright person deep within him, a wealthy guy, and at the same time leading his family into the right path, okay? And that's an ideal person that we could ever imagine. That is why he is a peculiar guy. He is not a kind of guy that is common all over the world. He is a peculiar person. And yet, out of these guys' descriptions, if you look at the earlier verses of the first chapter, 1 to 5, those descriptions would give us an idea that he was really living his life rightfully in the eyes of God. Yet, when you look at verse 6 onwards, you would see that this person, Job, became a subject of the conversation between God and Satan. There was a shift of focus here. In verses 1 to 5, the author was talking about a a worldly or an earthly scenario. He talked about the situation of Job describing his wealth, describing him as a person. But you look at verse 6, the focus of the camera shifted to a heavenly scenario. So from looking at what was happening on earth in the person of Job, it shifted to what was happening in heaven, beginning with verse 6. Now verse 6 introduces us about the angelic beings gathering in front of God, and God initiated a conversation with Satan because it so happened that he was there as well. While Satan was there, God asked him, where did you come from? And Satan said, I just came from the earth. I walked to and fro just around here. Maybe he was looking for a victim. We don't exactly know. The Bible doesn't say that in this passage. But God initiated a conversation with Satan, and he brought into the plate Job into their conversation. And he said, have you noticed my servant Job? This guy is peculiar. This guy is living a life that is blameless. He is upright in the way he conducts himself. And this guy fears the Lord and he avoids evil things. He avoids you. He was bragging about Job to Satan. And here is the response of Satan. Take note of this matter. Because usually Satan would respond to God going against what God is telling him. This time, God presented to him his view about Job, telling him that Job is a blameless man, an upright person, and someone who fears God, and someone who avoids evil. And Satan responded to him, does really Job do those things without any reason? I know of some reasons why he he does those things. Are you sure that Job obeys your commands? For no reason, God, Job thinks of something else. That's why he obeys you. And what he was presenting to God during this time is a concept called retribution. Are you familiar with the term? The word retribution means rewarding someone for the good things he made and punishing someone for the bad things he committed. There is an idea of reward and punishment. What Satan was telling God is this. Job is obeying you because of this concept. 
you bless him. You put a protection over him and his family. That is why he's doing what is right. He does what is right because he is after the rewards that you could give to him, and he already experienced your reward. Who would not obey you if that's the case? And Job is avoiding evil because he's afraid of the consequences of his mistakes. If he disobeys you, if he does something evil, if he abides with what I want, you will punish him. So the concept of Job's faith as Satan believed and perceived had to do with the idea of retribution. The faith of Job as accused by Satan was seated on the concept of retribution. That is why Satan challenged God. He said to him, Remove your protection from him. Take away the blessings that you have given him. I tell you, he will curse you to your face. He was challenging God this time. And God hearing him said to him, Okay, if that's what you want, let me give to you that authority. You may touch his possessions and the people around him, but don't touch Job. So Satan agreed and said, okay, I'll do that. Let me show you that he's going to curse you to your face if you remove your protection from him, if you take back the blessings that you have bestowed upon his life. So he left from the presence of God with high hopes that Job will indeed curse God when he takes away his blessings and when he removes his protection. So he left. And during this time, the scenario went back to earth. Job was there, and his children were feasting. What happened next was that while Job was probably relaxing, a servant arrived and told him, Master, Master, while we were in the field, the Sabaeans came. They came to us, and they got all your oxen and donkeys and they slaughtered, they killed, they murdered all your servants that are taking care of the oxen and the donkeys. What would you feel if you are in the shoes of Job? Well, the story doesn't end there because the text repeatedly mentions, take note of this line if you look at verses 16, 17, and 18. You look at this statement, while he was still speaking, while the servant was still reporting to Job. Somebody else arrived. Now take note of this. The first report was, the Sabaeans came to us, got all the oxen and the donkeys, and then they slaughtered your servants. While he was still speaking, another servant arrived and said, Master, Master, while we were in the field, a fire from heaven came down and consumed all the ship, including all your servants, the shepherds tending the flocks. And the text again repeatedly mentioned, while he was still speaking pertaining to the second servant, while he was still speaking, another servant arrived, and the person said, Master, Master, while we were on the field, the Saldeans came to us, and they got all the herds that belong to you. And all your servants tending these animals were all slaughtered by their sword. A trilogy, a trilogy of tragedy. First, the Sabaeans came and took away the donkeys and the oxen. Second, a fire from heaven. Third, the Chaldeans formed a band and took all other his possessions. What would you feel if all those things that you accumulated for years in your past were taken away in a blink of an eye? What would you feel? I have dealt with a family that, were, that was robbed by their, with their possession. I have experienced talking to someone who was scammed with a great amount of money. I too experienced that. I have seen individuals who went through similar situations like this, but I think they cannot be compared, their experiences, cannot be compared with what Job went through. I encountered a family whose house was burned to dust, and they were so devastated. And yet Job's experience was far more difficult than those we experience in our time. 
what did you feel when you went through those times? Have you asked the question, why us, Lord? We have been going to church every Sunday. Why me? Why my family? Why my sister? Why my brother? Why did you take his life? He's faithful to you. He shares his blessing. He's generous to our clan. Why him? Why me? Why us? And yet the experience of Job was far greater than what we go through today. And going back to the text, the text tells us again that another servant arrived while the third servant was still speaking. Take note of that. So this was repeatedly mentioned. While the first servant was still speaking, the second servant arrived with a bad news. While the second servant was still speaking, the third servant arrived with a bad news. Who would not be so tired of the bad news coming one after the other? Diba? We don't like bad news. That's why whenever somebody would carry a bad news to us, from time to time, that person who brings the message would also think a good news. At least, my pampaluba globe. And a person would approach you and would say to you, I have a bad news and a good news. Which one do you want to hear first? Of course, many of us would say, we want to hear first the good news. At least, my pampaluba globe. But in the case of Job, there was no bad news. There was no good news. It was a series of bad news. And the last one was far more painful than the first three. Because the first three had to do with his possessions. But the fourth one had to do with his family. The fourth servant arrived while the third was still speaking. And he said, while your children were feasting in the eldest brother's house, a wind from the east came upon the house and shook the house and destroyed the house and the rest of your children inside it were all dead. They are all killed. You lost your possessions that you accumulated for many years. You lost seven of your children whom you took care of for many years in your life. What would you feel? The more I ponder upon the emotional aspect that Job went through, the more it became weightier deep within, deep within me, and the more I am able to ask the question, why Job? When he is described as a righteous person, a blameless one, a God-fearing person, somebody who runs away from evil, why does he suffer these things? And this is a question that you and I may ask from time to time when we go through excruciating pain in life and we would ask, Lord, why me? Ngayon pa, bakit? And this is a reality that you and I go through. But the answer to that question has to do with God's conversation with Satan. Remember, God said to him, Have you not noticed my servant Job? He was blameless, he is blameless, upright, God fearing, and he runs away from evil. And you know what Satan did? Do you remember what I said earlier? Satan said, He, he does what you say for no, not, not for, for no reason at all. He has a reason for that. And what is Satan, what, what was Satan proposing to the Lord is that. Job does what is good because he is after your reward. But take away the blessings, remove your protection, he will curse you to your face. He is after your reward, that's why he does good things. And he will not do evil as you have described that he runs away from evil because he's afraid of the consequence or he's scared of the punishment. It is a concept of retribution. And God allowed Satan to have a hand over Job's life, over Job's possession and family. You know why? Because God wanted to prove to him that Job's faith was not seated on the concept of retribution. It was a testing after all. When you go to school, you learn the lesson. After you are taught by, with the lesson by your teacher, you are given a test. But in life, oftentimes, the lesson is learned after the test. Are you following me? 
in school, you take the lesson, the teacher will teach you the lesson, and after that, you will proceed with a test. But in life, oftentimes, we are brought to a test for us to learn the lesson. Job was an upright person, and he was put to the test to prove something that his faith is not seated on the concept of retribution as Satan was suggesting to God. What happened here? Did Job really curse God after he went through those painful moments? Let's look at verses 20 to 22. The verses tells, tell us about what happened next. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and he fell to the ground. What did he do? Look at the last word. Last word of verse 20. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell to the ground, and he worshipped. This is a very profound idea for a person who went through difficult time in life, and yet he responded to his situation with a worship before his God. How did this happen? Well, based on my initial evaluation, it only proves, it warrants that Job's faith in God is not resting upon the idea or the concept of retribution because now God has removed his protection from him. God has taken away the blessings that he has bestowed upon him and yet he did not respond in an evil way. Instead, he fell down to his knees before God and worshipped him. And added to that, you look at verse 21. While he was falling down in worship, he said this line, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. What he was saying is that I came out of a dust as God created man in the Garden of Eden from dust, right? He created man out of dust. And yet, when Job realized, thought about this matter, he said, I was created out of dust, and I shall return to earth as a dust. I was born naked, meaning to say, I did not have any possession when I entered this planet. I shall leave this planet without anything with me. It's okay for me, God. May your name be praised, or blessed be the name of the Lord. What kind of faith did he have? that he was able to respond to God that way? The answer to that question is related to where his faith was seated, where his faith was anchored. Because oftentimes, human beings, the normal tendency is that when we go through difficult times, if our faith is seated on the concept of retribution, we suffer this time and we evaluate ourselves and we look at our deeds in the past and we would say, there's nothing wrong with what I did there. How come I am going through this painful time at this moment? It doesn't make sense. Oftentimes, we categorize ourselves and our faith in relation to the concept of retribution. But Job is proving something here, and God is using Job to prove to Satan that the faith of a real believer... The faith of a real believer does not sit on the concept of retribution, but the faith of a real believer sits upon his understanding, upon the sovereignty of the God that he worships. I'll repeat. The faith of a genuine believer does not rest on the concept of retribution, reward for the good things that we do, suffering or, I mean, consequences or punishment for the wrong things we do. No, it's not like that. Our faith is resting on the very character of the God that we worship. And this God that we worship is sovereign in everything. He has the authority over everything in life. Thus, Job understood clearly about this matter. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You have all the power to do anything you desire. And I entrust to you myself with blessing or without blessing. I'll praise your name with protection or without protection. I will worship you. I will submit to your process. I will trust you, my God. And I am willing to suffer anything according to your will and purpose. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If a person who believes in God, if his faith rests 
upon the concept of retribution, that kind of faith will be shaky during a storm. Why? Because we often evaluate ourselves. When something is wrong that is happening in our lives, we look at our actions and we say, we didn't do anything. Why do I suffer? That's why when there is a conflict that happens between two people, within that conflict, we evaluate. If we are involved in the conflict, we evaluate ourselves and we say, wala naman akong ginawang masama. Ba't ako ang magsusorry? You see, we evaluate ourselves. And after our evaluation, we look at ourselves. If there is no wrong that we have committed, we're not willing to submit. I'm not discarding the reality that there are times you and I would experience suffering as a byproduct of our wrongdoings. For example, you fail in an exam. Eh, hindi ka nag-study. Kasi naglakwat sa ka lang. So that failure is a byproduct of your wrongdoings. But there are really times that you did everything and you tried to evaluate based on your actions in the previous days, you would notice that there is nothing wrong that I have done. Why am I suffering this kind of situation right now? That reality can happen in the life of a believer. And after we evaluate ourselves and there is nothing wrong we can find about our actions, our thoughts, and our words, and still we suffer, may, be, may we be like Job, whose faith is not seated in the concept of retribution, but faith that is seated on the very nature of God who is sovereign in all things. Yesterday, there was a necrological service here at the church. After I preached the message to the congregation, there was a group of about five people who came up on stage and they sang a very popular song that spoke clearly the message for all of us tonight. When they were standing here, they looked at the congregation and the music started and they started opening their mouth with the lyrics of the song, God is too wise to be mistaken. God is too good to be unkind. If you don't understand and you can't trace His hand moving in your midst, trust His heart. What does it tell us? The message of that song actually tells us that there are things in life that you will suffer. There are things in life that you wouldn't understand about. There are things in life that won't make sense, especially the sufferings that we go through. But may we have the faith of Job that rests on the sovereignty of God, not on the concept of retribution. Because at the end of the day, if our faith is resting on God's sovereignty, we would learn to worship before Him in the midst of pain, and we will be able to say, blessed be the name of the Lord in the midst of sufferings. You and I are not excused from going through painful times in life. We are not excused. God did not promise us a pain-free life, no. But when our faith is resting on God's person, His sovereignty, it would give us further strength to submit ourselves to God's doing and continue to hope that there is something beautiful that would come out of us from the pain that we go through. Just as gold is tested by fire to see its purity, so as believers in God, we are tested through our difficult experiences that we may come out pure out of those experiences that we go through. May the Lord's Word keep on ringing in our hearts and minds and bring us up to be purer than a gold and better than what we were before. God bless you all, and good evening.